listening to the House by the Video Store podcast. Welcome to the House by Video Store podcast. I'm your host, William. Joined by Derek. Hello. And Sean. Hello again. And on this episode, we're discussing the new movie, A Quiet Place, that just hit theaters recently. And we're recording this on the uh, the morning of Sunday, April 8th, so the box office numbers aren't out yet. But all the indications point to A Quiet Place being a huge hit, making over $40 million in the opening weekend, which would be more than like Get Out did and Split and you know put it pretty high up there yeah, now like people love horror films like i'm almost always surprised you know what i mean like even though we get excited for it and i know they always draw an audience it's yeah. like john krasinski yeah i mean not obviously he's like a really well-known name yeah um, but and emily blunt is as well but you know they're not tom cruise it's not tom cruise no. and, and you know the rock or whatever so yeah. it's just it's so weird how there will be like some blockbuster films that are seemingly you know something like say the mummy with tom cruise I'm not saying that didn't do well overseas and stuff but you know what i mean like some you think okay this is going to be this is going to do well for its budget or whatever yeah. but like horror films always come out and just say like hey we'll put people in the seats it's yeah. so wild that that is like an everlasting thing if somebody makes a decent well, what's, horror yeah film. It's, it, that's the thing though it's decent yeah. you know where you look at like i don't know what saw did but i, I don't think the saw had much buzz around it when it yeah. came out and you look at like, but I think what we're seeing now though is you're seeing like properties that haven't previously, that's, previously yeah, that's existed, the thing. New it's, properties. It's one thing if it's driving. a sequel or The Rock yeah. or somebody's in it, but like a new property that's just this thing, and you see the trailer and you get the idea, but you don't get the whole story, yeah. and like people are going in droves to see it. It's, yeah, yeah, it's pretty awesome. You know, I'm glad people are still going to see movies because like, like the this. only really exception to that probably in the past year would have been like it. You know, where it was like already previously yes, existing. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah, like with horror, because when I went to the theater, it was sold out um, because we have movie pass because Julie and I went and we had the, the movie pass thing where you can see an unlimited amount of movies. You can, but the rule is you only see one per day. So the, the problem with it is, though, you can't check in online or reserve seats. You have to actually go to the theater. And I think you're only supposed to go like at most like a couple of hours before the screening starts. Mm -hmm. So we were going to the 650 screening. We got there at six. And there was uh, the only seats left. There was like one. There's like a couple of instances of like one random seat by itself in like the upper rows. There's only like three of those. And then it was the two front rows. And we had to end up sitting in like the second row. But it's a theater that has the reclining seats. So it wasn't as bad because I was able just to recline it all the way and didn't have to crane my neck to be able to see the screen. But then like the movie itself was sold out because then those front rows filled up too. So like. It seems like horror too. That movie, that movie's PG thirteen, <clears throat> and, oh, watch, and watching and watching it, I never really thought about what the rating was um, while watching it. I just knew it was PG thirteen because there were teens there unaccompanied mm. in the theater. But I think that that aspect of that movie being R would have changed nothing about it, like because no. it's mostly not a lot of dialogue. So the only things I think that really would have pushed it to R was in profanity, yeah, that or gore. I mean, I mean, even the gore, though, like there's a pretty decent amount of allowance for gore, depending on what it is. Yeah, and how for it works. me, I just assumed it was R. But not to say I wouldn't <clears throat> yeah, I thought be it was shocked R. if this was on TV. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? If the gore level was on TV, but it never felt like any of it was restrained. It always felt no. like, hey, we're shooting this way because honestly, it was sometimes the most effective. Like, you know, there's no like flat out somebody getting split open on screen you know in a slow being slowly being ripped apart well, the thing is, yeah. but they, it didn't need that they've you know? done that on the walking dead before yeah, so like, i don't see why it can't be yeah but um yes yeah, so everything talking, seemed deliberate though with what they wanted to do it's almost like they made the film and they're like hey it's pg-13 you know what yeah, i mean like i'm yeah. sure yeah, they, they probably they, got it done and then looked at it and then yeah. submitted it. i'm sure like, they oh. probably had the goal of, of pg-13 just knowing the story they wanted to tell but um but yeah. it's cool that this has almost more I don't know, more thrills than some R-rated horror films as well. Yeah. You know what I mean? That do show some gore. Like, it's, I don't know. Yeah, but before we get into discussing A Quiet Place, we'll, we'll quickly go through some things we've been watching to recommend or discuss. So, um, in theaters recently, I saw Ready Player One, which is funny that A Quiet Place might have a better Friday to Sunday opening than Ready Player One did, so oh, wow. beating out a Spielberg movie. But, um, yeah, so Ready Player One was based on a book that was from, like, 2011, 
that's essentially in the future, in like the 2040s or 50s, everybody plays this online uh, virtual reality game called The Oasis. And it's where the, the majority of like the U.S. economy is Oasis based. So it's kind of like cryptocurrency. Um, well, no, it's just like the <laughs> in the game, like people like all the revenue is generated from yeah. the game because in the future, the world is crappy and bad. So people spend all their time in virtual space versus the real life where they live in like stacked trailers. And and then the creator of the game passed away and after his death, a video is released saying that he had hidden an Easter egg in the game. And if you find the Easter egg, then you take ownership of the company that controls the game and all of his shares of the company, which is worth like a trillion dollars or trillions of dollars or something. So there was three keys that the characters had to find in the game. And if you find all three keys, the first person to do that gets the, the Easter egg that gives you control of the game and all of his shares and money and everything. So... That's the basic premise for the movie, and it's just about the main character who in the Oasis called Percival, like him and his friends finding the keys and trying to get it before this big corporation can do so that wants to take control of the Oasis and just litter it with ads. Because they have like a scene where the guy is saying, like, we found that we can put ads on 80% of the player's viewable area before it induces a seizure. <laughs> so it's like that, to me, like, you know, 30 years ago, that would have been gibberish to people. But right now, it's like, no, that's probably discussions that, like, Facebook and YouTube and these different game creators have had. Like, well, we can, you know, plaster visual ads on this much of this yeah. before it causes people to get upset. And But, but still, too, even the in-your-face ads, like Back to the Future 2. You yeah. know, like the Jaws ad from yeah. that. And then, like, Minority Report, I think, had a little bit of that in there and stuff. You know, it's... People have known this was coming for a long time. It's just now they know how it is going to be implemented. Yeah. You know? <laughs> One and two, so the movie is a reference fest. There's a ton of references to movies and games and and there's stuff that, because like the thing is like the creator grew up like being a huge fan of 80s stuff. So then there's Back to the Future in it and there's a bunch of references to 80s properties and music and things like that. So the game, the movie has a bunch of references to things, and there's more recent references in it too. Like it has references to like Minecraft and Halo and Overwatch and um, and other like Blizzard games mm-hmm. and stuff. And it's like that to me just seems like product placement. Product placement that they could put in there and it not be a huge deal. Like there's even a quick cameo from like Spawn in it. And- yeah, I mean, but then again too, that's that's fun for like younger generations. You know what I mean? Who even like we have those touchstones of the '80s, but kids who maybe grew up with Minecraft. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're like, oh, yeah. You know, like, that's a touchstone. Yeah, because, like, some of those that kids... That is theirs. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because, like, some of those kids are going to say, like, the Iron Giant, because that's in one of the trailers. Yeah. That means yeah. absolutely nothing yeah. to them. Yeah. yeah, well, it's just, like, it has... So it has a bunch of references to things. And um, so the movie itself is, like... What I would describe is, like, it's fun enough, like, big-budget blockbuster fare. Like, this virtual re- reality world is kind of interesting, and it's not one of those worlds where it's completely unrealistic as to how it works. Like somebody puts on goggles and then they're in a fully formed 3d universe where they control a character with no controllers in their hands or anything like that. The logistics of it are interesting because like one of the players is like on a multi directional, um, uh, crap. What's the, yeah. Thing? One of those like pads that, um, what are the, the exercise things? Treadmill, mm-hmm. a multi-directional yeah. treadmill that, so you just walk in the direction of your character and you have like things in your hands. So you're replicating the movements, but then like if characters are jumping on top of things and sliding and kicking and stuff, are they doing that? In real yeah. life? Or is that just like button combos they learn on the Probably. controllers that they just don't show off screen. But so overall, like the movie I found to be enjoyable, like first watch and made me think like, oh, yeah, like a VR ever does get to a point that it's big, like would the Matrix would be real. But yeah, because I don't think we get to a point people plug something into like their central nervous system and then are controlling it with their brainstem. But well, if having you believe conspiracy theories now, we're actually just living <laughs> in a uh, uh, Matrix type world. Yeah, there, the there is. um I don't know if it was a helmet or what, but basically something somebody puts on the side of their heads. I don't know if it was shown at CES or an E3, like at the, what is it called? Uh, Kensha Hall or something. It's like the back area where all the weird stuff comes out. Like that's where like Guitar Hero came out of and things. Yeah. But essentially there was something that could detect your brainwaves and you could actually control things on like a monitor. 
with just yeah. your thoughts. I know they had so like, it's like, you know, it's like mm, well, 15, 20 years. Well, they, had, might. they had that Star Wars Force thing, too. You put like a thing on your yes, hand. Yes, exactly. You're to move yeah. Something with. yeah, I think that was the evolution of that. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, like, but the technology of it in general, like, to me, I didn't really have any huge, huge issues with it. And two, like, in that universe, if you get in huge debt, they have these things called loyalty centers, which are essentially like prisons where you're just locked in a cube and you have to go in the Oasis and work off your debt by accruing in-game currency. So it's kind of like those um, back in the day with World of Warcraft in China, they had like people whose entire job in China was just to like farm gold Mm -hmm. and (laughs) in-game currency that they would then sell for, you know, real assets. So it's like all this stuff isn't that far fetched that like people who get into debt would be forced to go in the game and just like mine currency for someone until they've reached an amount that pays off what they owe. A lot of the action is just kind of standard. It's all CG. So unlike some like a lot of movies that have CG where it's trying to be photorealistic, this one is obviously like game avatars that aren't real representations of <laughs> so people. So it's cool that it's, it's totally fine that it's not photorealistic. That's yeah, and, I mean, and it looks yeah. good, and and there's a bunch of references and stuff in it, and like overall, I thought the movie was enjoyable. It was only after the movie was over that I kind of thought about stuff because I saw somebody mention um, like on Facebook about how in this entire movie that was about the 80s and, you know, really includes stuff from the 90s and 2000s, there wasn't anything that were female-centric properties in it. So from all the 80s stuff, there wasn't, you know, Care Bears, My Little Pony. There wasn't any of the stuff that they, you know, go overboard with nostalgia. None of it was anything that was yeah, but, aimed at women. <clears throat> but know. if the author came up with the stuff, if we did that, we wouldn't be putting Care Bears so, in there. You know what yeah. I mean? So like, it's only, or you could also say, too, like the 80s was kind of weak with stuff like that anyway. Well, it wasn't the, really even until maybe like the late 90s or early 2000s or even re- more recent where you have a lot of female driven well i think that the problem was though that, that weren't so like in the universe and... there i think their argument is that the creator of the game was obsessed with the 80s mm-hmm. and people have become obsessed with what he was obsessed with trying to determine all the clues to figure out how to get the keys and get the easter egg so his pop culture preferences became everyone's mm-hmm. as they tried to figure things yeah. out so there's that and but i think too that that's kind of a weak argument because they've they i mean they have spawn and halo in it they could have put some other stuff in yeah. there but it's just like, to me, if it's all male screenwriters, they're just catering to themselves and not really thinking about it. Not even notice that till it's over and somebody mentioned is like, oh, yeah. But with again, all the stuff like, they did, they could have put something in there. But that just kind of goes to show you maybe, too, like how weak those times were with stuff that actually had cool female characters. Well, I mean, you I know? think... Because you had, like, in the 80s, you know, you had... I think, I mean, I mean, I think, like, Laura Croft might have been in it, but Laura Croft was more for boys than girls yeah. early on because of the way the character was modeled. Was there any reference to, like, aliens with Ripley or... Um, there was an alien reference, but there was no Sigourney Weaver. Or, I was saying, because like, there's, like, stuff like that, there are strong female characters that make sense to have in well, it's 80s just, and it's just, it, it didn't call out to me when I, I didn't, like, once again, as a man, it didn't ring any bells for me when I was watching it. It was only after I got finished and somebody mentioned that. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it seems like they didn't do any, put any effort into getting any properties that were not just things aimed at teenage boys in these eras. And, like I said, that's part of the, the movie being based on the creator's preferences and probably just the screenwriters probably from their own things. Um, so, but the movie in general, there was nothing necessarily wrong with it. It was just like I watched it as a fun popcorn flick. I saw it with Movie Pass. So, to me, like if it wasn't for Movie Pass, I may have not spent my own money to go see that movie and waited for it to hit video. But uh, is this a movie that will be good to see on a big screen? Because that's why I've been thinking about trying to see it. I mean, there's a lot of visuals, yeah. and there's a lot of sound, and there's a lot going on. Last Spielberg film I saw in theaters was probably Minority Report. Um, I try to remember, like, I saw, I know I saw War of the Worlds. Um, Did not even watch what that. What is he, because he's directed stuff in recent years. He's done a lot more of, like, yeah. Lincoln. Like, I watched and, Lincoln, but at home and stuff. I really enjoyed that, yeah. So I was just thought, okay, cool, this is like a popcorn Spielberg film. You know, it might be cool to see in theaters. Yeah. Um, I mean, so it's a big visual treat because there's a bunch of stuff going on in it. And it, and I think it is a movie that would benefit from, you know, high-powered sound system and mm-hmm. big screen because there's yeah. a lot going on. And there is one part, and I won't ruin what it is because I think it would kind of spoil it for you. There is a part of the movie where, for one of the challenges, they go within a movie. 
And when they actually did it, I was like, are they actually doing this? And it's like, oh, shit, they're in this movie. And it's like, oh, so they've recreated these sets either digitally or, you know, um, in person. And I was kind of blown away. But then they kind of at the end kind of go away from what the movie was into something else. Um, well, let's, let's, let, I'll just say this because I've heard different films that like people have been talking about on like film Twitter. Yeah. Is it a film that is was made, um, you know, I guess that was probably around, let's say around 1980. It's a film in the 80s yeah. that would resonate with our audience. Yes, okay, I know which one you're talking about. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so That's that, another reason why I'm interested. Like, so, like, it was funny, though, is some people love that and some people hate it. Some people say you're shitting on the legacy of this film and filmmaker, and other people say, no, it's just like a fun, well, loving Well, like he was nod. friends with the filmmaker, too, yeah. Spielberg was, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. So, overall, it's a movie that I enjoyed. Um, it's popcorn fun. It's not like a deep-thinking movie. It's not going to change your life, but it is just a general... Um, the general story that mostly all big blockbusters were for a very long time and not to get political, but I think this is a movie that a lot of like men's rights activists and alt right people are kind of like, hell yeah, give me another movie starring a white dude. Who's the good guy for once. None of this black Panther wonder woman crap. <laughs> so, cause I did see that reaction. Some, I mean, hmm. I don't think the movie it's Spielberg, so it's nothing like negative. It's just standard you know young guy kind of um everybody type you know young guy gets thrust into a magical journey where he has to prevail against like an evil corporation so kind of the story you've seen before in a lot of places with a lot of pop culture references you've seen other places but the movie itself is enjoyable just to me it's not like landing in my top five of the year or anything but i did enjoy it it was only when I thought about it afterwards that I was more like, oh, wait, there are some elements here they could have done differently. But yeah, from what I've read, I haven't read the original book, but it does seem like people who have read the book said that Spiel the movie was a better adaptation than the book. They <laughs> trimmed out things because I think in the book they had to like literally recreate and role play like war games is one of the challenges. Yeah. And then this one, it's more like there's a race that they have to figure out. And then there's. <laughs> You know, going within this movie. So, then, like, it's funny because this movie actually has, like, a scene from, like, Spy Kids 3D in it. It's really? From, like, yeah, from, like, where they're all racing and everybody's wrecking. It's oh, like, okay. That was Spy Kids, which that was from something else, too. Yeah. But it's just funny. It's like, yeah, Spielberg took some from Spy Tron. Kids. Tron. I mean, Tron. Yeah. You know, in a virtual world racing. Yeah, like, but I'm just going with that's where they took it from. They ripped off the Spy Kids. <laughs> which, yeah. actually, Spy Kids is... Th this is movie Spy Kids because... In Spy Kids 3D, they had to go in a video game and win, and there's like money and Elijah Woods in it. So and, there, it's yeah. funny too in the movie thinking about it. So Ben Mendelsohn, who is one of the actors in the movie, he was in Rogue One as the guy that's overseeing the creation of the Death Star, and he's in Ready Player One. And at one point, he references something about Star Wars. I'm like, that's too meta. It's just gonna Don't fold. do it. It's gonna the film just like folds in on <laughs> itself, and the so, screen goes black. But like, and then the architect from the Matrix comes up and starts <laughs> yeah, explaining we got the references. Movies, yeah. He's like Neo. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna talk. You've for collapsed minutes. the Matrix. Well, so, like, if I had to yeah. give it a score out of ten, it's like a six and a half, seven. Like, enjoyable, fun movie. Nothing deep. Uh, visually, it's really entertaining. Um, it moves relatively quickly, um, and I enjoyed it. And it does make you think about like where VR and gaming will be in, say, 30 years, like how prevalent will it be in society? Because right now, like Facebook is a big control, you know, big element of controlling the Internet. People view everything through Facebook. So at some point, will that switch when VR is available to a VR environment where people are or, or AR, you know? Yeah. Um, I think AR early. is probably just putting on, you know, contact lenses or glasses that have AR yeah. and that all your ads are just in the real world. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's probably the first step. You yeah, know what I, I mean? Think the, the think that the alternative reality stuff where it just puts it in your physical environment, mm -hmm. that's like a big thing that could be big in the next 10, 15 years. But we'll have to see all the technology. Um, but like Ready Player One was just like a possible, not how it's going to be at all, because people live in stacked trailers in Cleveland, Ohio, or Columbus, Ohio, because it's like the fastest growing city in the country. It was because yeah. it's I, I <laughs> read, I, bought, I got that book and I probably read the first couple chapters, but then I fell off of it. I was like, eh, I don't know. It just didn't, it didn't hold me. And uh, Mark Rylance, that's his name, right? 
Is that the author? I don't know. Uh, no, he was in the oh. movie okay. as um, Holiday, like the game's creator, and he was really miscast. And he somebody pointed out he seems like he's doing Garth from Wayne's World. Oh God! Um, now I really want to see this. Uh, and Why not just have Mike Myers <laughs> yeah, just doing had... Garth as the villain <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the ultimate '80s villain. Yeah. <laughs> and Simon Pegg is in it. Or uh, um, yeah, Garth. I mean, Danny Carvey. Yeah, it's Mark Rylance. He just seems really miscast to this character that has like long hair. So that, like when they're supposed to be younger, Mark Rylance and Simon Pegg just have long hair. <laughs> it's like that does not make you automatically What's up, younger. Dude? It really so Simon Pegg uh, on the bad guy side. Uh, he was he's he's in the or like without spoiling things he's he was one of the co creators of the company right. mm-hmm. okay. and not part of the evil corporation. There's, Steve Wozniak. There's okay. two questions in this movie. And if both answers are no, then it is trash. Do they reference "I'd buy that for a dollar" at any point in this movie? Uh, no, but they do have no, a brief. No, they do no, have a brief no, RoboCop no, cameo. Does Robert Stack make an appearance <laughs> in a trench coat? <laughs> no. No, then the movie's trash. Okay, so overall, I thought it was an enjoyable movie. Nothing uh, groundbreaking, but it is something that, like, on the big screen, it is visually interesting. I didn't see it in three D. I don't know if it's in three D. Yeah, I don't I, see stuff I, in three D. I assume. Anymore. I no. assume it is. I hate three D. But um, Quit I like a th- movie. I like three D. It just it's one of those things where like I've there's only certain movies I feel like need it. Yeah. That, that's the, what I was yeah. thinking this would be a good three D movie because you go into the virtual world. Like yeah. I think it would that's why I was like, I kinda wanna even though it's not like my most anticipated film that I want to yeah. see that I've missed, like Black Panther and stuff. Yeah. Like it is still a film I would well, like to see in theater. And then you had to pay more for it. And, and I like, think oh, it's the most well, inter- it's, it's, money. it's uh an entertaining crowd pleasing movie from Steven Spielberg that he hasn't done a movie like that in a while. Yeah. Um, cause like war of the worlds, I'm trying to remember, I think that's like his big last big, like spectacle mm-hmm. movie. And since then he's done more of, you know, the like Lincoln Munich, war horse, um, war horse, uh, Oscar bridge of spies Bait. doing more of like the adult movies. Um, not really the big blockbuster movies, but a lot of historical stuff. I mean, he's yeah. all, you know, he started doing that. What? Like in the early nineties with. Schindler's, Schindler's List, List and stuff. And then Saving Private yeah. Ryan. And but it seems like, I think I was watching an interview, and as he gets older, it seems like he's very much more interested in history. That's how I'm getting to well, I'm too, getting more interested in history as I and, get older. And that movie was him being like energetic and bringing the energy level to that that it seems like a younger director might. Yeah. So he's still like, you know, at 70, pumping out movies that you wouldn't know how old he was yeah. based on seeing it. Well, so he's that, doing, he's oh, he did Indiana Jones also. I, oh, that's the last Kingdom one I of saw. The Crystal Skull. That's the last one I saw yeah. in theaters. But he's doing the next Indiana Jones now. That's yeah. what they're doing. So, uh, bring it back. I the th- real quick, the thing I hated about Indiana Jones. Let's not even talk about the script or anything like that. Was how much it looked like it was on a set. Yeah, sound stage. Yeah, yeah, like that was just so that because the other it ones just took like you that. out of it. You know yeah. what I mean? Like that's the one change I hope they make. Um, because I didn't think it was the worst <laughs> film in the world, but Harrison Ford has no interest in going into jungle I, yeah, nowadays. Yeah, I mean, I don't blame him really. <laughs> yeah. but let's just hope I'm they looked at it and jungle. said, "Look, this does not hold up." Like, I mean, yeah. build this physical... looks cheaper than all the other old films. You know, yeah, it looks terrible with yeah. like the CGI ants and stuff. Yeah. Um, just briefly, the other movie I saw that it's still in theaters, I think, but it's on its way out. So if you want to see it, you have to see it in theaters very soon or like the budget theaters. But Unsane, the new Steven Soderbergh movie that was shot on an iPhone. Uh, and to be fair, it wasn't like they're just holding an iPhone just on the side handheld. That's so how I wish they did. They it. weren't sh- like going world star. <laughs> <laughs> so it was shot on an iPhone 7 Plus, which is the same phone I have. And I would used to shoot part of our short film, Twin Trees. And like not to. I think he saw your short and thought, I can so make the, a feature. So the, the, well, I'm pretty <laughs> sure it's because he saw the movie Tangerine. But like, like not to give myself credit, but the stuff we shot in Twin Trees handheld outdoors to me looks more dynamic and colorful mm-hmm. and well shot than anything in Unsane. Because um, they shot an iPhone 7 Plus. And I think they use like the brand is Moment. They use Moment lenses on the camera. Um, for Which are fairly cheap, right? Like you, you can buy like a that. kit for like under $200. It yeah. has like, th- like a fisheye and like a 35 and 85 millimeter. And... They used a DJI Osmo Mobile, so it's like a little stabilizer you can buy for like $200. And, of course, they use like professional sound capture equipment and lights and stuff. But the movie just, there's parts of it where you the, the visuals don't make a big difference. You can't really tell. There's parts of it where they're in outdoor scenes and the characters are properly exposed, but the the sky is blown out and the highlights are blown out. So what that just means when you see a scene where you don't, you know, use like a filter on the lens to bring down the light levels, your characters will be properly exposed. But because the way things are set up, like every 
like bright surface is just a white blob. It's the dynamic range on the camera. Like, you know, yeah. the, the larger, the, the the more dynamic range, it can show like the dark shadows, but not be all black and then yeah. show the bright spots. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like the iPhone definitely has major limitations yeah. next to an actual film camera. Yeah. yeah. And two, it, like if you it didn't look, they, it didn't look like they were using like neutral density filters on the lenses mm-hmm. and then lighting the scene. Yeah. It looked like they're just shooting a natural light and letting it blow the highlights mm-hmm. out. So, I mean, that's whatever. That's like the technical side of it. Like for the average film goer, the average movie goer, they probably don't pay that much attention to that stuff and it probably doesn't bother them. Camera nerds and filmmakers will look at it. Um, but the movie itself is about a young woman that thinks she's being stalked and goes to a, um, goes to like speak to like a counselor at a, at a healthcare clinic and then ends up um, accidentally involuntary commit, involuntarily committing herself for 24 hours and then it spirals out from there. She thinks she sees her stalker working in the hospital. And it's kind of like your standard mental institution story. Like somebody's in there against their will that doesn't really belong there. And, you know, then the movie does play with the idea of is she really seeing this stuff or is it just a delusion? And but I feel like given the disdain we have for mental health in the U.S., like making movies so the about movie, that, where it makes the mental so the, in the movie bad without is bad. without spoiling it, it's like in the like when she goes to see like the counselor and talks to him, they give her some paperwork. It's like, oh, here's some standard paperwork. Just fill this out, and we'll take talk about next steps. And it was the paperwork to voluntarily commit herself for 24 hours. It's like to me that seems like a huge violation of anybody's rights and freedom. Yeah, null and void that contract. And that seems like that could make people possibly hesitant to go yeah, seek mental saying, health. I, I think that is the so, And then like it ended up being like as a corrupt corporation that people actually felt repercussions for involved with the company, but that doesn't change the fact that it's more of like a systematic thing they talk about in the movie. So in real life, if you are experiencing extreme distress or you feel like hurting yourself or others, do go seek help. This movie is not a realistic representation of how that works. I was saying, it just, it's one of those things that's been going on in movies for ever now. And it's like, I wonder if any point in time, like, hey, maybe we should change this. A but basically, the movie follows a lot of beats you've seen from other things, um, you know, like her and this mental institution and the people who work there and stuff. And... Like up until like so the first two thirds of the movie, I was enjoying it quite a bit. Um, like the iPhone stuff to me is more interesting, like on a filmmaker level, but to the average person, it's probably not a big deal. Um, and then the third act goes in a little bit of a kind of standard way that I thought wasn't all that daring. It was kind of um, standard, you know, par for the course for mm-hmm. the type of genre movies. It didn't really do anything super new. So the third act, I was kind of like, oh, okay. This didn't ruin it for me or anything. It just, it didn't really do anything that left me feeling any differently about this movie than I have about a lot of other similar genre-esque movies. Because this movie really could have been like a Lifetime type movie. Mm -hmm. Um, Just without the, you know, the A-list talent attached of Steven Soderbergh and Claire Foy, it would have been a little bit less um, uh, covered if it was just... You know, Lifetime movie of the week starring yeah. some, so you know, up and coming actress and like just a journeyman TV director that would have been different. And I think the iPhone was more of like a mark because they still spent like a one point five million dollars on the movie. So the iPhone was more of an experimentation by Soderbergh than um because they could have shot it on like the cameras we use on stuff for not much more money and got a better overall image. Yeah. I mean, we've been talking about that like off camera a little bit. So, you know, he's obviously interested in kind of the process of filmmaking and kind of, I don't know, experimenting some. And, you know, he's put that edit of uh, Ray's Lost Ark on his website, you know, without any sound and just black and white to see how like visually that story is told and stuff like he's very much interested in, I think, learning about the craft and continuing to learn. I also wondered... One, he said he liked it because he could move fast. You know, yeah. not have to wait for big cameras, you know, yeah. large cameras to be the whole crew because it is such like a big machine to get yeah. like, hey, if, if I have an idea, I want to shoot it now to see if it works. Yeah. Um, but I, I haven't seen the film. But another thing I thought about, too, was like, do you think at all maybe this was a almost like a psychological choice? Um, on shooting on an iPhone for the audience because, you know, something like Blair Witch was so effective because it looked like our home video. Yeah. You know, was this like, I know this isn't like a found footage thing, but do you think it was any at all shot on the iPhone to give it 
try to give it some sort of weird meta realism because well, it looked like footage we might see no, on our phone. From the interviews I've seen with him, though, he said that it wasn't part of their marketing gimmick, and he thinks that on a big screen you can't tell that it was shot on the iPhone. So it doesn't seem like for him the intention was for the audience yeah, to be okay. super aware of that fact and to watch it because like um like the crank movies or something where it's obviously on video and they have a bunch of weird angles mm-hmm. and stuff this is more traditionally shot yeah so to me like i get the element of it moving more quickly to shoot on an iphone but having shot on an iphone just using like so i use um the panasonic g7 like a little mirrorless camera for a lot of stuff i've shot throwing a um a lens on there that's like a zoom lens is just as quick as the iPhone actually quicker to me because you don't have the quirks of the iPhone, like the filmic pro app locking up when you Mm. try to switch settings or change it from like when you, when you're holding the phone and you start it holding it where it's in um, portrait mode and you turn it to be landscape, the phone lock, like the app will lock up and and you have to restart it a lot. So to me, it feels like using just like a, a cheap camera that was like $500 with a $800 lens on it costs about the same as an unlocked iPhone gives you way better options in low light and and seems like it would be just as quick because they still have to do external audio capture because the phone mm-hmm. can't, can't capture stuff so uh, it's a gimmick and i get that people think the phones are the future but i don't know that the iphone is the filmmaking yeah. feature i think it's just it's an option and if you're out there now and you're sitting there and you have an iphone in your pocket you can buy the 15 dollars filmic pro app like a tripod and some holders and you can go shoot a shorter movie on it just follow um, the same principles of, you know what I mean, that you would do, try yeah. to light it or whatever. Yeah, you still need to light it. You need I, external audio. Yeah, I, I wish I could see this on the big screen because I, I could definitely see it looking cheaper on TV. You know what I mean? Like, there is some parts at the end of it where like a person is jogging yeah. and they have it like on the stabilizer and the footage just looks janky and it's just like bad gimbal footage. Mm-hmm. And somebody was saying that, so, oh, that's just, you know, part of the filmmaker letting his, no, it's like, no, that's not his artistic intent. It was probably just they had a cramped timeline and thought they could stabilize it better in post or something. Because yeah. using the iPhone, there are some eccentricities of a phone sensor that just when you shot with it, you see. And in the movie, there was some of that. Just yeah. like the characteristics of it that you can't get around because it's a phone. So is it worth seeing now? You know, when it comes um, to video? Yeah, man. Video, I think it's worth watching. Um, we Like, once again, with Movie Pass, saw it in theaters, so I didn't have to pay out of pocket to see it. Um, like, seeing on the big screen, I don't think it looks that great because um, a lot of it's like brownish, yellowish colors and low light. And there's parts where people's faces aren't lit because just the sensor's not very good in low mm-hmm. light. So... The movie as a whole is just kind of a standard, you know, mental institution story that you've seen a lot before. And I, I want to see Indiana, the new Indiana Jones shot on the iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> By Indiana Jones. Yes. Yeah. It's all <laughs> selfie cam. <laughs> so did uh, you all watch anything? Uh, one of the movies I watched, which I've really, you know, outside of what we were, we're covering, I've really watched a bunch of Unsolved Mysteries. I'll get into that in a second. But a movie I watched is uh, being that the last podcast I was on, we talked about Mortal Kombat and... There's a big discussion between me and Sean just since then, like, because I like both, you know, Mortal Kombat, mm-hmm. Street Fighter, whatever. But there was an article Sean posted it and uh, covered a movie, Hard Times with Charles Bronson, where there was two scenes in that movie that maybe kind of inspired Street Fighter. The backgrounds, yeah. yeah. So, like, the two would be Ken's level in Street Fighter 2, and I can't think. Zangief. Zangief. And uh, so I went and watched that movie just to kind of check it out. And uh, Hard Times is Charles Bronson's, like, in uh it's pre-world war ii but it's like uh during the great depression so he's traveling around street fighting it's kind of your standard i mean we've seen this movie a lot or maybe i have and i know a lot of other people have too it's like yeah street fighters making money so he beats everybody that the rich evil guy has so he goes and hires a professional and then he beats the professional uh but i think what was kind of cool about it is like you kind of forget how good of an actor charles bronson was because that movie's premise is not very good but he's really good in it yeah and one thing I think is really enjoyable is you go and watch what in shape people look like in 1975 compared to what they look like now. <laughs> there's like no diff. There's no comparison. Now, Charles Bronson is actually in good shape. Yeah. Like even by today's standards. But a lot of the guys he's fighting, they're in good shape. We're like, not. None you of know, them are the people, rock. No, no. Yeah. It's just funny. Yeah, people being you know. in good shape in the 70s and 80s was often that they were just, they worked out and had strength. But like. Physically, they would be solid, but not ripped. Yeah, and that's how these guys are. There wasn't, what, yeah. this, maybe not an obsession like it seemed like there, or an exact science yeah. like there is now, you know, where yeah. people 
like mid max, you know, all their weightlifting and stuff like that. Yeah, it's just funny because you see like this dad's like, this is the strongest man we got. And it's just like, <laughs> the guy looks strong, but you're like, well, we go watch, like, you go look at uh, Thor 3 and look at Chris Hemsworth. <laughs> or just like, like compare okay. like a Bond, like the early Bond movies of Sean Connery to the ones with yeah. Daniel Craig yeah. and just and see what happens. Because back when Sean Connery's Bond, it's like women are like, man, that's a slab of man. Well, yes, he was actually a weightlifter <laughs> before he came and then And then now you see Daniel Craig, he's got like a 28 pack or <laughs> yeah. something. And so where did you watch this film at? What I just streamed on Amazon. Amazon? I, I bought it. It was like two bucks or something to, to purchase. Uh, but I really enjoyed it because it is kind of cool to go back and see where it's like they definitely not 100% pulled it, but you go and see the similarities. You yeah. Know? And I know, really, but he's a street fighter yeah. also. If he's a street fighter. Yeah, you know. but it is just kind of cool to see like stuff like that. that uh, kind of, I, I'm not going to say it's obscure because it is Charles Bronson and that was like in the 70s mm-hmm. was kind of like that was in 75. So that's kind of, I want to say in his heyday, but he was still really relevant. Mm-hmm. So it is a movie I've never watched before, but uh, he's still one of those characters in the movie where it doesn't, doesn't have many lines, his character doesn't mean lines of dialogue. But I really do enjoy those movies where it's like kind of the drifter character, just kind of your standard Clean Eastwood, kind of mm-hmm. just doesn't talk very much, comes in, does what he's got to do and gets out. But you have to have the right actor. And you had to have the right story or it doesn't work, you know, and I, I do kind of miss those characters in movies nowadays because we don't really get those a lot. I mean, only God forgives wasn't I mean, all he was silent. Was he a fighter in that? I know he fought a lot, but mm, I'm not for sure. The Ryan Gosselin film. Um, the I haven't to drive. seen that. No. Yeah, I didn't see what the follow up to draft. I saw um, part of it and I, was, and I just never finished it. Yeah, I mean, it's not terrible. You know, a lot of people were disappointed basically coming off yeah. the drive, but definitely watch that film. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, it's I not love stellar, like but it's that. but uh. It just it is cool seeing like you want to go see what other movies influence yeah. that too, you know. Even because it's just funny to me when you think of Street Fighter. I don't know thing of it would have thought like a seventies Charles Bronson movie helping inspire I, some stuff. I was think always thought of the Sony Chiba yeah. Street Fighter film series. I just yeah. thought, oh, they're just you know, and yeah. and, and whatever else. So yeah. uh, something else too is just you know I've been watching a bunch of unsolved mysteries. They have seasons one. Through, they have all of them. They have all the Robert Sack one through twelve on uh, Amazon. So I've been watching that. I've been watching it probably since like Thanksgiving. I've slowly watched all of the episodes and I'm just kind of watching it again now because I'm obsessed with it. But I really love that late 80s, early 90s, the first couple uh, seasons where they're, it's in the middle of the satanic panic and every single friggin' case, Satanist. It doesn't matter what it is. Like this guy goes missing and he gets shot by his ex-wife and somebody else. And it's like, well, she was a Satanist because he caught her in lingerie in the uh, their little shed in the back of the <laughs> devil. And like they get the Son of Sam stuff and they pull all this. And it's just like, I don't remember that as much because that was like when yeah. I, was, I wasn't even born yet. But like, do y'all still remember any of the reminiscences of the Satanic Panic? Uh, oh, yeah, like a little bit. Yeah. A little bit, yeah. yeah. It, it kind of died Like on talk 90. shows and stuff. Yeah. The thing, you know, it's like... We always need something to be afraid of. You know what I mean? Like, honestly, now it seems like the big scare thing is immigrants. You know what I mean? Like, there's always something that people need to point to to be afraid of. You know, it's it's. Well, it's it's a weird well, like, a weird tendency. Yeah, even on the know? X-Files during the earlier seasons, like the X-Files itself, they'd be like, oh, it could be a satanic cult. And they're like, that's almost mm-hmm. never the case. <laughs> yeah. Like on yeah. this fictional show, they're talking well, about how it's not. Like, I wish I had episode numbers to give people because there's but this is like the first five or six episodes. There is a guy that falls off a cliff to his death and he dies. And what it was is he just did, they were into LARPing in the early 90s, late 80s. So that was kind of Live like, action role play. And, and Dungeons and Dragons. And his dad and them didn't really understand what it was. So they thought that he was a Satanist. And it's like, no, dude, he just LARPed. Yeah, yeah like, people thought Dungeons and Dragons yeah, was like He for just sure. LARPed and he played Dungeons and Dragons. There's no satanic it's panic involved in that. There's nothing there. Well, because like, kind of like Stranger Things is kind of revisionist history on Dungeons and yeah. Dragons because they all play it and the parents are cool with it. But yeah. back then people their kids are playing it they're afraid their kid was going to join a cult worshiping Satan yeah. I, I hope the next season of Stranger Things like what's the kid with the messed up teeth that got him Dustin, fixed Dustin yeah. I hope Dustin like gets way into the cure and yeah. he, he looks like a goth in the next yeah. one like I hope one of them makes a huge change yeah. but I, I just I just love watching those old episodes and seeing like how all this stuff relates back to that and it's like I wonder what a current day Unsolved Mysteries would focus in on. You know, like like you said, would it be the yeah? Uh, it'd, would, be, uh, pizza, it, it'd be it'd be Pizza Gate, yeah, Pizza Gate, uh, QAnon, and, which I've read some about recently, yeah. like the Roseanne Barr supported conspiracy. Oh, yeah, it yeah. just I, I love the and I've went. I've, there's a couple podcasts I listen to just because I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I love listening to that stuff. 
and the know that people think that there really are lizard men and it's reptilians. They, yeah, reptilians. And then one of y'all <laughs> posted a video about the time traveler videos on YouTube. Yeah, like and you did. Yeah. you did, and there's no that people get millions of views yeah. off yeah. Of these shitty narrated and stories. It, and it's always like blurred face people yeah. saying they're from the future that yeah. can't provide any concrete was details on anything. That YouTube channel Chad sent us about something because I was uh, looking. It might have been because I was clicking through too, and it was like this time travel like is meeting himself from like 50 years in the yeah. future, and it's two blurred faces or something, and it's just like. I understand that it's like world... we just had sex. Is that gay? Yeah. <laughs> like, it's me. Like, but it's me because I, I love unsolved mysteries and weird stuff. And there are some really interesting cases in there that you go back and you watch. And you can definitely kind of see where movies that we've covered or maybe being influenced by it, or just different stuff like X Files. Actually, I think was one of the pilot episodes was inspired by something they saw in Unsolved Mysteries. So it's funny to see how that's kind of worked. It's you know that big piece of pop culture also worked into other mm -hmm. bits of pop culture. Yeah. Uh, but I guess one, I wonder, you know, do you think that would be something they could revitalize, or that people would even be interested in? Because obviously, like, because I've heard even like YouTube, like they were just released. Well, it. YouTube itself, like, there's so much content out there, like the Reddit, like paranormal subreddit, and all these different like websites devoted to paranormal stuff and videos about conspiracy theories and creatures and stuff. It, I think a well-produced and well-researched show would have a market for stuff like that mm -hmm, because it is popular. Sure. But I do think that you would just get cries of uh, fake news from people that support the conspiracies or anything yeah. they investigate. Well, yeah, you would lose the effect. We talked about this with reviving X Files. That that was such a you know of its time of its time because it was like this was the one source you know for this type yeah. of stuff. And back then, this was the one source. You didn't have the internet. You know what I mean? Like you turn that on and just got creeped out as hell because you couldn't research anything. Yeah, you just watched it so and now thought. You know what I mean? Like you would hear about, they would mix in real life murders with ghost stories and yeah. alien stories and it made it all so creepy. You know, now I think the veil has been lifted and so much is exposed and we can easily research yeah, stuff. Yeah, it makes Go it, to Snopes yeah. and all that stuff. Like It's not as fantastic. It, it, it won't have the same effect, but it definitely, there's a market, I think, for that type yeah. of show. You would just have to know that it's yeah. not going to be the same thing at all. I, it just yeah. is one of those things where like, I just look at it and it's like... <laughs> You go and you watch some of this stuff, and it just so, just for the reenactments alone. Oh, yeah. If you can go and watch some of the reenactments, which I didn't <laughs> yeah. realize this till like the other day that Arrested Development made fun of Unsolved Mysteries. Because I, as a kid, I remember like the, the reenactments being really good. And the first time I watched it through, I, I was like taking it seriously. Mm -hmm. And then the second time you're watching, it's like, man, these reenactments are like, really <laughs> bad. Like, well, that's you know, how it was. Well, yeah. Like, because um, like, was it lore is kind of doing like going into the backstory of like, urban legends and you know debunking or showing yeah. the research behind it and having reenactments on the amazon series but that's all stuff from you know one 200 years ago but it's nothing the difference current. too is like they actually have actors on there that yes. like you re recognize well, they, it. yeah because like, they, they had, had real actors show well, they up. had uh the guy that played in the who's the villain from terminator 2 was in there oh robert patrick yeah robert patrick was in there and you see these people like oh i know that woman i know that man and so it's like whereas unsolved mysteries they were just like hey you want to put a wig on and get shot and you're yeah. like yeah. okay and then you're getting shot and you're like looking at the camera well, you're it's, dead it's probably it's like, stuff realistically shot in like one day yeah with like video cameras I, so. no i was like to think the only person that did anything was robert stack like he's, <laughs> he's filming and directing the uh, <laughs> the reenactment yeah. he's like got no time for it so he just <laughs> yeah yeah that's what that's all i got um yeah so I watched, got the Last Jedi. I watched that. I watched the film again. Showed it to my wife for the first time, and then watched the the director and the Jedi documentary on the making of, and that was like super fascinating and really really awesome. I highly recommend that. Like it is a flat out documentary. It's not just like, hey, this is a behind the scenes yeah. featurette um, made by seemingly documentary filmmakers. Um, <laughs> great interviews. Just awesome to see. Like, you know the scope of that production and like i think they said with like the sets that they had to build and as big as that film was it was bigger than the force awakens and rogue one put <laughs> together so like just the logistics of that film yeah. was like a nightmare you know what i mean like just trying to figure it out and get it done um it is like super super fascinating uh to watch that and and you also get like i think it's probably a good watch for people who maybe were Star Wars fans but weren't hot on the film. Yeah. To, you know, you see a lot of where they're coming from from certain things. You may not like where it ended up, but um, you at least kind of get perspectives. You know, Ryan Johnson can talk about why he was doing this or what he thought about the film and where he thought he needed to go. Um, 
And then I've watched some of the other special features on there. And I, again, I thought they were going to be like most, some DVD features where it's like these, they seem like, you know, a little glossed over um, just media, promotional media things where it's yeah. like, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll watch this like seven minute featurette. <laughs> and it's just them like talking about the film and like basically being excited about it. Like each little special feature featurette is also like really well made. Like it might be like 10 minutes on this one thing. I just really hope that at one point Harrison Ford was there for some reason. He's really <laughs> grumpy the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> but no, they talk, you know, Frank Oz is there. He's talking, they're talking about getting him involved, you know. Um, with the special effects people and and why they felt like they needed the puppet because um, you know that was Muppet. that was that was what Luke knew as he didn't yeah. know the CGI and you know what I mean he was yeah. like that was really important to do this and Frank Oz was like are you sure you want to do this because the logistics of like going there on location <laughs> and shooting and all you know what I mean all this stuff um, yeah it's super super fascinating I highly recommend that especially if you like filmmaking at all um, it's just it's just really a really really fun watch. Um, and then, uh, what else did I watch? I watched one other thing. Oh, the, um, uh, I think it's called the Zen Diaries of Gary Shandling and the Zen Diaries or something like that. The Judd Apatow, um, documentary he produced for HBO on Gary Shandling. Did you guys ever watch the Larry Sanders show? I know about it. I've watched yeah. some of it before. Yeah. yeah I mean, not really, but it, I need to. Yeah, you definitely do. It feels like a precursor to, um, uh, you know, Arrested Development and 30 Rock and stuff like that. I mean, granted, yeah. there was like Mary, Mary Tyler Moore that was like the workplace um, TV comedy or whatever. But uh, it is, I think it is like a masterful show. I haven't, I hadn't finished it because when we had HBO at our old place, I think we were starting through it. And then we like, were in the process of moving. We probably made like 50, ep- we got like 50 episodes in or something and yeah. then moved. And then by the time I was like, oh, we need to like start from the beginning. So we need to start from the beginning and watch it over. But I recommend just watching some of those episodes, you know, watch like just a few of them. Um, it's got like a stellar cast and it's so, so good um, and very, very smart. It is not just, you know, it's a, they said when they put this on HBO, HBO realized, hey, this is what HBO should be. This yeah. is like defined the shows and the content they wanted to make for HBO. Um, and it is like so, so, so good. But the uh, the Zen Diaries documentary, Judd Apatow, I didn't realize how close of friends they were until I saw like some of the comedians in cars getting coffee. <laughs> um, and Jerry Seinfeld, you know, him and Judd Apatow was talking about Gary Shanley after he passed and getting emotional and stuff. And um, Gary Shanley's on one of those as well. But the documentary, it's two parters. I think the first one's either an hour and a half or two hours. And the second one's like two and a half hours. So it's like four or four and a half hour documentary. And it is so, so good. Like, it could have easily been double that time. Like, Judd yeah. Apatow, he's obviously a, a good filmmaker. You know, when he's on, he's on. Yeah. Um, uh, and it's it was great to see him do this. And it's got tons of interviews, um, which I wasn't even going on for any interview. Sometimes you watch that to see, like, your favorite celebrities talk. You know what I mean? About something. But um, I just want to, you know, hear about Gary Shandling. But it's got, you know, like, Jim Carrey, um, Dave Coulier, <laughs> Bob Saget. They were good friends. Uh, you know, Jim Carrey. Uh, Sarah Silverman. It's just like a ton of people all like all the love they have for this guy. And it's, I don't know. I love seeing people's processes and kind of their philosophies on kind of comedy and creating stuff, you know, like, and that's what it's about. Like his, his strive for, to, to be a, I don't know, an artist in some ways, you know? Um, and it wasn't always about the business for him. It was about like striving to do better and, and how it all kind of, everything in his life and everything he creative creative came from him losing his brother when he was like 10 years old. Um, so it, you know, it's the film like has a thesis, you know, like it's like, it, it keeps wrapping around to that kind of, um, so it's just, it's a very, very well-made documentary. Um, but for those that haven't watched any of Gary Shandling's stuff at all, like at least just watch some of the Larry Sanders show. Like if you like comedy TV at all, because for me, even though I hadn't finished the series, I need to start back over. Like I would rank that as top five comedy shows that I've ever seen, you know, well, for he, sure. He's been, he's been on a lot of stuff. He was in like Captain America, uh, the winter soldier and Iron Man and Iron, Man yeah. and Iron Man too, where he's, he's been in a bunch of different movies, like big stuff and yeah. then TV stuff. And so you've probably seen yeah, somebody you've seen him in something for sure. I mean, he, yeah. And I think the reason he was in that too is, um, you know, as he got bigger, he was a mentor to a lot of people like John Favreau. And um, I'm trying to think of like all the people that he was a mentor to. But basically, that's what they also touch on was 
all the people that he kind of helped, um, you know, he didn't have kids of his own, yeah. but that was basically him being a parent to them. And that's why you see him in a lot of stuff because he just was you know, involved with a lot of different yeah, people's he, careers. They were like, they, they were like, I wouldn't be surprised if he did like some script writing on NCIS or like helped <laughs> out, you know, people might've asked him, they said, because yeah. he like would help so many people, even when he kind of stopped working. Yeah. Um, because he kind of, you know, you hear about how bad that business is, Hollywood is, and I think he got tired of it at some point. There's some legal legal things and some cases he was involved in um, that basically turned him sour on people in some part and and the business. Um, but even after that, he still like helped out constantly with friends and stuff. Yeah. And they were, like, he worked on so many things, and he just had this huge ripple effect. And um, they were like, he's basically kind of the you know the reason modern he was kind of like a new era of modern comedy and and his effect and approach to things kind of rippled out from there and touched so many people and so many people's works um so yeah the documentary is fascinating but even if you just watch a handful of the larry sanders show um episodes and you're like hey i kind of like this like and you want to watch the documentary and jump over it's definitely definitely worth a watch it's it's stellar it's one of my favorite things i've watched this year for sure but i like gary shandling a lot um and i love the larry sanders show so Yep, that was pretty much it. Um, watch some other things, but uh, save that for next week. All right, so we'll get into the review of A Quiet Place. We'll hold the spoilers to the very end when we say they're spoilers. Um, <laughs> spoilers! Yeah, we're just gonna scream <laughs> Spoiler it. alert! So uh, we're talking about A Quiet Place from 2018, directed by John Krasinski, starring Emily Blunt, John Krasinski, uh, Millicent Simmons, and Noah Jupe. So... And then two is something I'm like, it's not a spoiler. Like in the movie, none of the characters call each other by their names because the movie. So the majority of the movie is silent, is silent with um, like American Sign Language use between the characters because the oh, English well, American Sign Language. Oh, wouldn't it be English Sign Language or no, it's called it American. It's oh, called it's ASL or whatever. So um, the daughter of the family um, is deaf and has like the cochlear implant and stuff. So because of that, they would have been they would have all known sign language to begin mm-hmm. with. So in this world where there are there's a threat that responds to sound using sign language as a way to communicate without making noise. So there's very little dialogue in this movie that's at an actual speaking level like we are now. There's like maybe two minutes at most of like dialogue at a normal volume level. Um, everything else is like hushed whispering or sign language. So the movie is mostly silent and surprisingly to me in the theater, like, as we mentioned earlier, like when I saw the movie was sold out and in the row in front of me and the row that I'm in, there were teens just by themselves. And I remember how like shitty people were when I went to movies in like high school and middle school and stuff. And I think the worst movie going experience in my life was too fast, too furious because <laughs> a bunch of 12 year olds were there but and you were 13 like damn it these kids oh, that, <laughs> I'm just kidding. that came out in like 2003 <laughs> two, two, three. i was old enough to drive there but i was still in high school <laughs> and like the kids like kept kicking all the seats and like rapping along with the rap songs and it's like good god um but the but the silent the theater i was in was silent for the entire movie like nobody was talking mm-hmm. during it and everybody was along for the ride. Well, it is a really poor movie to eat popcorn at. Yeah, or if you have like, gas or anything. When you're sitting there and you're like, yum, yum, yum. You're trying to listen to the movie and yeah. you got a bunch of people chomping on stuff. Because luckily time. I had gotten food, but I we got to the theater early enough. I was able to eat all of it before the movie started. Yeah, yeah. I had heard, like, don't bring any loud candy or food. Yeah, yeah we, we, just, we, like, yum, we yum, sat down yum, a half hour time. before and ate most of our popcorn yeah. before. And then, like relegated to a couple other times and that was it yeah because if you're if you're watching that movie and people are making a lot of noise that can take you out of the experience so it's a movie that the experience (laughs) in the theater helps but it can also hurt if you have a bad audience yeah if you have a bad audience so i think we kind of break this up a little bit because this is definitely a film like it where you can talk a lot about the world and situational stuff and what you would do and honestly some things i thought about was like well that's kind of dumb that this thing is in the movie or whatever. Yeah. So before we like l- launch into like talking about that stuff, cause that's fun to talk about. Yeah. Let's hold that just for a little bit later and maybe talk about, I don't know, just the good parts. Well, I mean, I think that the, the performances from everybody are good. All the um, actors in the movie are great. Mm-hmm. Now the way they choose to do some people's own, you know, whatever. Uh, well, I think that the movie was as far as the, 
actors are good. So everybody's performances are good. And like for the role of the daughter that has like the hearing implant and hearing aids and stuff, like John Krasinski, I read in interviews, actually wanted to cast someone that was, you know, actually had hearing disabilities and like, you know, cochlear implant and new sign language. They wanted to cast somebody um, that was not just a, you know, normal hearing or someone that didn't have any hearing disabilities. They want to cast someone and have them portray, play that role. Yeah. They want to get somebody that actually had hearing disability to portray that role because a lot of movies in Hollywood they cast people with different conditions and they almost always just cast like one of a handful of like, you know, main Hollywood actors and just have them portray something (laughs) versus finding an actor that has that condition, having them portray it. So I think that getting that was a smart move for that role. Um, Because the actors that they got did a great job. Yeah, she did a really And I've heard like John Krasinski in interviews like rave about her performance and acting and everything like that. So like, that's something I think needs to happen more often is you don't cast, you know, Brad Pitt to be in a role where he has some disability or condition. Like Benjamin real, Button, you need to yeah, get a real person. You get a real person that <laughs> looks like they're 80 when they're 20. But I mean, I mean, that's something that if you're watching the movie, you, if you weren't told that you wouldn't know, you know, anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think that that's just a sign that you don't have to, cause I'm trying to think of other movies or people have done, things like that where they cast people um like you said somebody that has hearing impairment they would just cast an actor that doesn't have that and have them portray it i think that if there are capable actors who have the hearing impairment yeah. why not get them because they're going to bring more to that role and understand they the script yeah, better they, they understand well, it, okay you know? so devoid of that what did you guys think of the film so like the, as in, in a bubble and like i said there's a lot of things where I can like say, Hey, well, this was kind of weird. This was dumb, but like, you know, just the yeah. experience on the whole, because I mean, that's what this film is. There's so, nothing super deep about it. It's just kind of your experience. Yeah. Like, the way that I would describe my overall feelings in the movie are similar to signs, the M night Shyamalan movie about mm-hmm. aliens that came out years ago. When I saw that movie in theaters, I came out of it having really enjoyed it and the tension that it created and the experience that it took me through from beginning to end it was only after I sat there and thought about the movie that it kind of fell apart. Yeah. Um, in a quiet place, I don't think it falls apart to the same extent, but I think that as a visceral ah. experience, I enjoyed it and came out of it having, you know, I enjoyed it. Um, thinking about it more, it's like, well, some of this world building stuff um, made me question, like, you know, the overall world, not even just the main characters and their situation, mm-hmm. but the overall world. Like nobody figured some of these things out. It's like, it that, just, yeah. And that's what I was so, like, they say that for the end because there's so much to pick apart, I think. So yeah. I think that like, if you take that out of it, like as a visceral experience, I enjoyed it and I came out of it, you know, if I had paid money to see that, I would not been, I would, you know, if I had granted the movie pass I am paying for, but it's not the same as like paying for every mm-hmm. single ticket. So coming out of that, I wasn't upset. I would not have been upset to go to see it. Um, I've seen a lot of reviews that are calling like their favorite movie experiences or one of their favorite movie experiences in years and like one of the best horror films in years. Idiots. I don't think that it reaches that level. No. I think it's a solid thriller, solid mm. like horror I, thriller. It really? But is, is it a, really that solid? I think it is. Like, so I think there's that, like, like three on, tense moments in the movie. And on, an execu- that it, it's on an execution like, level, there's one moment in like without spoiling anything, there's one moment that kind of reminds me of Aliens um, that has to do with water. That that was kind of yeah. cool. I mean, they're but good like, moments. So the it's movie it's... itself, um, like I enjoyed it, and I came out of it saying, you know, this was a like from John Krasinski as a director. He hadn't done horror before, so I came away thinking like that was a solid movie. But I think that like when I was discussing this with Julie the other day, or after we saw, it's it like to me it kind of feels like an experiential movie. Like you go and you watch it, and you come away from it. And you enjoyed what you saw, mm-hmm. but there's not a lot more there to dig in. I mean, there is a little bit in the father daughter relationship. There, no, yeah, there's. I I totally agree because honestly, I think I last night or this morning I woke up and was like, I think it was last night. I was like, oh yeah, I forgot I had even seen that film and I saw it that day. You know. So I think it's a movie that um, that delivers like it does it does so just to lay out it does have some jump scares in it but it's typically not the super unearned type it's uh, like there's one of them there's, there's one, one of, the, of them that's really bad that's like oh we'll be poltergeist not poltergeist wait amityville horror but 1970s. i think i don't know i i yeah i enjoyed the jump scare a couple jump scares like because i jumped a little yeah. bit and sometimes yeah. i don't normally i don't well and like, the, i think they were effective for me and the yeah. thing too though that i have come to realize though is with horror 
if you don't do some of the jump scares, the general audience comes away like that wasn't scary at all. Yeah. Man. And if you just try to do slow build, you know, slow burn horror, then people just don't react to that because like it had a bunch of jump scares, but they were all, but, but they were all like part of like a set piece. and there was all stuff there. It wasn't like some wilderness thing. So like, um, with no squirrel, like I'm trying to think of other comparable movies to this. for me. What came to mind was 10 Cloverfield Lane. Like, yeah, because I like that film. Um, you know, maybe there was a little bit more in that film because it was there was a tension. Uh, is like, is this person a bad person? Is he telling the truth? Like, there was yeah. more there to the character relationships in this film had. Yeah, but at the same time, you know, the kind of walk into theater, you have this great little experience, and you walk out, and you can kind of forget it. You know, maybe I thought a little bit more about Ten Cloverfield Lane, but. You know, this felt like just a classic little monster movie. You go see in the summer, you see it, you have fun while you're there, and that's it. Like, yeah. I think it was great on that level. Yeah. Um, it's not anything that is, you know, I'm not going to put it up there next to, you know, one of my favorite horror films of all time. I don't even expect it to be my, to be my favorite one of the year, really. And we yeah. still got some more to go. Well, I, but I think given that this movie has monsters, like, and that I don't remember it is a bad thing. Well, it's like Annihilation for all of its faults. Has one monster and you're like, holy shit, that was good. Mm -hmm. Like that scene alone, when we come to the end of the year and we talk about stuff that happens, you're going to remember that and we're going to bring it up. So I think this movie doesn't have any of that. And so, at any point in this movie, it's like this is just a weaker version of War of the Worlds. So like I think that, I mean, War of the Worlds isn't a terrible comparison. It's a, um, a pretty similar. And, so like, and, and I know it's even Spielberg and Tom Cruise, but it's like this is just like the poor James, man. Uh, with Krasinski and Krasinski. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's so it's like, it, it's, there's a drop off on that, but it's like, well, this is a, in that vein of stuff. I don't know if it's aliens and everyone, well, really which, is, which is fine. Something else that works in the movie's favor is the runtime is relatively yeah. very rest, short because very it's, short. A, it's listed as an hour and a half. So like take credits out. It's probably more like an hour and like 20 something minutes. Yeah, so it's really short. It's a movie that's a brisk running time. And luckily I did not have to use the restroom during the movie because mm -hmm. yeah. I got to go right before it started because we got there so early and it was a movie that I didn't really see anybody get up from their seats and go to the restroom. But like, you know, taking out the quality of the movie aside, just like the running time of movies, I think far too many movies bloat their runtime up to two, two, yeah. mm -hmm. two, two plus For hours no when they have no content to fill that. And to me, it's like, don't spend the money to shoot all the all this unnecessary stuff. Just trim the runtime down because do we really need every comic book movie to be like, do we do all the DC movies need to be almost three hours? Well, like it, Batman. Yeah. I mean, or, stuff? or every monster movie, you know what I mean? Like that's again, you may not stack this up against, you know, epic horror films like the shining or something, but I think it's great to have a variety of experiences. And that, yeah. that's what this is. Like it, it is knows what experience. it is. It's yeah. like, Hey, we're going to give you a short run time. Um, some cool scares an interesting little world. Yeah. And, uh, a, a new, uh, somewhat new concept that I can't really remember in any other mainstream horror yeah. film. And here so you go. The movie, here's some good scares. Like I think, so it yeah. succeeded on that there, level for me. The, the, the problem I have with the world though is, is like, I know that, you know, they date it. So like it, it, at the end of the movie, when everything happens, like the core of the movie is like 400, it's like about a year and a half away since the day one of that, mm -hmm. whatever it is that happened, invasion came out, whatever they came from. It's still like in really ultra clean world. And I just really feel like given everything that's happened and the lack of resources, you're not going to be that clean at that point. Well, I, mean, I, I think, just don't see there's any way. Well, I think a lot of it is. So any post-apocalyptic type thing, whether it be zombies, whether it, it be, be dirty, invasion, it whether, it be, whether it be virus, whatever it is. In real life, it's kind of hard to know what that would look like because that's never yeah. really happened. And you have like abandoned war torn regions in the world, but that's different than what these movies are proposing. So, yeah. for, so that element, you like, just take more foliage, like an annihilation or something. You know what I mean? More foliage, yeah. basically. Well, too, yeah. well, too, though, you don't know where they're at. And I thought it was like in Pennsylvania or something. That's where I thought so, it was. I mean, so too, if, is, if they're on a farm, they could be self sufficient. They may have their yeah. water supply well, and they may have their own, you know what I mean? Like electricity. Yeah. Okay. Ow. So, <laughs> so basically, you weren't super hot on it, right? Here's my thing is like, I'm going to dump all over it, but I'm probably still going to give it a decent rating. Yeah. But 
there's a certain thing was it expectations of the reviews because what it has like every, a, does it have 100 percent still on it had, a real, it had 96 percent around and that doesn't mean it's the best thing of all no. time it just means those critics it, yeah. it got, most critics said it was positively reviewed but, yeah it, but then a lot of people push it as just like really good monster movie like oh yeah it's best mon-, like bloody disgusting was really bad about that is this is well great. they overhype a lot of yeah, stuff they overhype a lot that's of what stuff. people read they read yeah. But you go read these art, yeah. But you go read these articles, and it's like it's a monster movie, monster movie. And it's like okay, if I'm thinking of monster movie, I'm thinking of like the thing, or I don't know. I mean, a, just th- see, that's th- a th- very see, narrow definition. No, but it's see, not. But, but see, I'm watching just, this too, I thought okay, you know, there may be some things where people are like, oh, I want it some more monster action. But I was thinking like, as a monster movie, I can't think of any. I mean, I'm trying to think of another comparison, but what other monster movies have came out in? Any sort of like close proximity time wise so that sh- have shown this many monsters and had that many monster moments. So like, the, there's not, not many. Not so many. if you yeah. were to th- if you were to think back in recent times, so the past like two years, movies I would say are somewhat comparable. Um in in the basic idea, not in the movies themselves, you have the ritual, which is on Netflix. You have Annihilation, but I mean, like these are all but, completely different types but, yeah. of movies. Yeah, but the monsters are like such a small part. Like this is like the, pretty well, I think the difference is this movie, like without spoiling things, you don't you get an early indication as to what's happening. You don't wait till the very yeah. last 10 minutes and then see it like a lot of slow burn horror does. Yeah. Or, you know, like it comes at night when shit nothing, goes bad, shit goes bad. So no spoilers for it. Yeah. Like, but it comes at night like nothing really came. Uh, so this movie isn't the prestige horror. That's really just a psychological experiment. This is like it could almost be an episode of The Twilight Zone or something mm-hmm. um, or like an anthology type show or series. Because the runtime isn't that long, nope. yeah, it's very and short. and and there's that element. But just like comparing this it, to like to say the ritual or annihilation or something, those movies build anticipation and mm-hmm. dread towards seeing what it finally is. And this movie doesn't like you kind of get glimpses throughout, so there's no real building dread moment yeah. towards getting a reveal. Mm. It's just you see some, and then you see some more, then you see a lot more. Yeah, like I and, can't think of a. As far as if you want to see a monster in a movie, like popcorn monster films, I can't think of ones that kind of even compare to this really, you know, the past 20 years. Like, how many do you it's, see? It's this feels like a Resident name. Evil almost with how much you More, see the monsters, yeah. you know what yeah. I mean? Like, which is cool because in your mind you think, oh, it's a monster movie. There's plenty of those. But really, there's not many like this that kind of just go all so out and just show you the monsters. what I would compare this to, so going back to The War of the Worlds, the Steven Spielberg, mm-hmm. Tom Cruise one, so the last or the third act portion with Tom Cruise and um, the kid in the house with Tim Robbins character, you expand that idea to an entire movie and you have a quiet place, yeah. um, kind of close quarters, um, humanoid ish size creatures, you know, bigger than humans, but in the same general vicinity. And that's kind of what this movie is. Yeah. Um, and like the movie itself doesn't give you a lot of background on on what the situation is. It's mostly just if you were to watch this on Blu-ray and you could freeze frame, you could try to read the news clippings Except and different things. On the whiteboard, it's like very kindergarten explanations as to what's going yeah, on. And it's like well, why what it is. <laughs> why well, is that there? But that's that's a visual explanation. Yeah. Um it's and unneeded. It's, this is does not seem like a film that was that they broke the script down and really tore it apart and brought it back together. Like it really does seem like it is a very, you know, surface level <laughs> like, concept in like, horror film <laughs> to there to have fun. Yeah, and it's, it's like, like Monsters bad question mark. Yeah. And it's like really yeah. just, I mean it so, no, wasn't actually on the board, but it's it like, was that's almost that. Yeah. yeah. Basically almost that. a lot yeah. of like so the movie itself, so it's it's delve into the creatures and things like that. It just kind of leaves it as they exist. You don't really found out yeah. why. Which I think is great. And I, I, and I think that's better than the alternative. And this the main story, like the central story to the movie is the the family dynamics. Yeah, which this is why and, this movie is the Baba Duke. And, and the family dynamics are a lot of the relationship of the daughter yeah. and father. Like this movie is very similar to the Baba Duke in the fact that it's kind of covers similar ground. It, it's like the all the family dynamics are what drive the movie and the monsters simply exist so in there. What I would so all the issues do not actually come from the monsters themselves. But from they the solely dynamics. come from the family. But, but also too, like so I'm watching this, you know, the not much happens with this, so it's not much of a spoiler, but the the mother and father, they are so, you know, so on the same side and like well, and they're a real life married couple too, so there's they're, additional. They're, well, I'm saying they're. Well, that's the weird thing too. It's like, 
so plenty of people argue in the world we live in now yeah with much less stress you know what i mean like okay you know you have things in life i just imagine what an actual couple would be like in this world yeah. and how much they would fight and argue and like you know like shut up and like wanting to well, you know just the stress of the whole situation yeah. and trying to f- like, but maybe it's saying, "Hey, if you're like that, you're gonna get killed off first because you can't stop." Fighting. Well, I mean, maybe yeah. that's why. Maybe that's why they existed. <laughs> yeah, I know because they were so in sync. They knew how to work together. It's like yeah. he makes like a quippy joke and she doesn't laugh at it, and then he just goes off on like a yeah. very insecure well, rant. Just, so yeah. the that's what I think could have been maybe more interesting if they would have mind if it would have felt. Well, the like movie, a, a richer uh, relationship between those two like because the kids the kids relationships are good like yeah. it feels like okay we built some character here and it's not they're not just placeholders well, the, the to get killed of, off or to yeah. be, be chased or With whatever the amount of runtime the movie has I would say it's more like visceral reaction to circumstances than plot um, mm-hmm. but that were like you know holding that for spoilers it's like the movie doesn't have a lot of characters sitting there contemplating their position in life and what they can do <laughs> it's just reacting to the circumstances that it's, that you know un, you know evolve around them and it's much more of a visceral it, reaction it, than it is you know it, and it is it about it is about like hey put you know put yourself in these shoes wouldn't this be terrifying well, and, you know and, and They've shown the part in the trailer with Emily Blunt, right? I yeah. mean, they, so is that a spoiler? I would say, like, I personally did not really watch the trailers and tried to avoid So, well, let's forget that. But there is another element to it that I think they could have mined more, but I think is super, super excellent and uh, something great to take advantage of. Yeah. Um, but, um, but also, there are some other elements where I feel like they could have mined even more. You know what so, I mean? In this film. But again, they talked about a potential sequel, so there's a lot more places to go. But, um, but at the same time, it maybe 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 the things to mind would not have been uh, as much of a payoff. Well, expanding the runtime. I also don't know if this movie needs a sequel because I don't. I I think it's standalone. Yeah, I don't think it does either. But they've talked about like, hey, you know, because it's they've built a world. It's going to make a lot of money. You know, yeah. I think that the where they leave the story off, like they've defined a world and the rules and set these characters up, and I think that's all you really. Well, and two, and when I say a sequel, I don't even mean the same characters. You know what I mean? Like. I, or character or whatever. I mean, but to me, like yeah, a sequel anywhere. in that universe, it's a different set of characters in a different location. Yeah. That to me, that's just like you can make so many other things. Well, they just well that would be bun- cool if it was like not the same thing again and but it was to, totally different. Like, I want to like, see it with like just, a mom camp. Well, just like a bunch of moms. Dawn of the Dead to yeah. Day of the Dead, or, yeah. or you know what I mean. Like Day of the Dead is that's, so different than Dawn. I feel like, you know like what, I mean? what like, you would end up with as a more contemporary uh, comparison is you have Walk the Walking Dead and Fear the Walking Dead where Fear the Walking Dead promised to be something else than ended up being the same type of yeah. thing. I think with The Quiet Place, if you were to make a different movie in-universe with different characters, if they're not using sign language and mostly being silent, then they're going to die immediately, and it's a different movie. Yeah. Oh, so, well, wait a minute. Or this would just be the version of Chlorophyll that actually has what people want to see in it. Yeah. yeah so yeah. <laughs> with smaller monsters, but yeah. yeah. So like just to kind of, before I get into the spoilers, so I think that the movie does do something effective and then it weaponizes sound and anything in the movie that makes noise makes you pew, pew. Uh, concerned about <laughs> it. Uh, so it does that. And I think that a lot of how much you come away liking, loving, or hating the movie is how much you identify with the character of the mm-hmm. daughter. And if you identify with her more, so someone who you know does have hearing impairment that's around her age range is going to buy into her completely because they're going to understand that viewpoint. If you buy more into the viewpoint of John Krasinski's character, then the movie becomes more frustrating, I think. And I think that's just where you come in, like your frame of reference indicates where you kind of fall. But the movie itself, it does have good visceral thrills. But um, like the story stuff, we can save... So, like, giving this movie a score out of 10. So, Derek, since you were the most... Six. Six out of 10. Six out of 10. Because to me, it's like one of those movies where it's like, it wasn't a bad experience, but just like Sean said, like, and you said, like, we had just watched this movie and you almost forgot you had done it because Mm -hmm. while there are monsters in it, there's never a moment where you're like, 
like, like Annihilation's movie, I wasn't too hot on, and there was a moment in the movie where you see that. And it's I like, can't man, wait that for Annihilation was... thinking more about it because there's more to think. But, but I'm saying, be just as far as a monster goes, you're talking about just the scares. Yeah, yeah. There's just one set piece where they have it, and it's like that was incredible. See, I was like, and I, I remember that. See, and, I disagree. I didn't think that set piece was that was that amazing. I saw it, and I was like, yeah, that was okay, but it wasn't. <laughs> I, like, I, I I really yeah, loved it, and I, really I loved the way that was handled, yeah. and that was one of my favorite. And because monsters. like I haven't seen anything like that. The only ever. other thing I've ever seen like that was the thing yeah and but with this movie there wasn't any scene where i'm like that left a mark on me that mm-hmm. i'm gonna remember that because this movie didn't have that there wasn't like teen scenes that were so tense that you were just like like is there's moments in it where things were like so tense for me you're like oh even though i know what happens because i've seen that movie yeah. and read the book and or rest of the book and stuff but it's like with this it's like i didn't have that moment it's kind of forgettable. There, see, for me, there's one really, really good scene. In it. Well, there's, I think, multiple good scenes in this film, but there was one for me that was like, okay, this is very smart. This is a great scene. Um, maybe it could have been mined a little bit more, but and that's why it's maybe well, a little bit forgettable, but yeah. I think it was a great concept. Something and a too, great idea. Um, the movie was shot on film and had like film grain, which is add a little bit of texture to it. Yeah. That I think don't, it wouldn't have been there with like pristine HD, mm-hmm. you know, 4K transfer. Good looking film. So it's yeah, a good looking film, Sean film. I just think that the film's kind of added like a texture to it a little mm-hmm. bit and kind of added to the texture of the kind of outdoorsy locations mm-hmm. and things they shot at. So, yeah. So, Sean, what would you give it out of 10? Um, so, I would probably give it like an 8 out of 10. Again, yeah. like I kind of forgot about it a little bit, but um, I would to- if this was on TV or HBO, I would totally flip it on and watch this at any point of the film yeah. because I think all of it is actually pretty great. Um, it's just there's not enough meat on the bones to really fall super in love with it. Yeah. Um, I think a, most all of the scenes are really effective. Um, you know, like I said, the 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 parents feel, I don't want to say completely one-dimensional, but they just feel like your typical hero characters. Like, they don't really have many faults. Yeah. You know, they're not... It just seems like they they don't seem as super fleshed out. Is even like, you know, the kids almost. Yeah. Uh, John Krasinski, he plays a good guy dad you know what i mean and, yeah. and maybe one of the kids is, is unsure about her place in the family or whatever but um but basically i don't know it's the the there's some good moments with the parents for sure and i yeah. love emily blunt um like i said i think there's some great scenes in this film i like the monsters a lot um the ending i think um when it ended i f- almost felt like it ended a little prematurely but then i felt well i don't really didn't really need much else but it almost caught me off guard um I almost expected it almost like it almost like it ended halfway through the third act. Well, like, yeah, that's kind of and that was fine after I saw it. But at the moment I was like, oh, oh OK, you know, so, what I like, mean? my thing is, if it lasted five minutes longer and resolved all of the dangling plot, there, threads, there would have been nothing. I don't yeah. know that it changes much. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Because if it just results in the same as like the prior portion of it, then it's just <laughs> a little bit more fan service. Well, there, exactly. there's, only, there's only, we'll get this spoilers, but there's literally only two ways that ends and one's really good and the other is very bad. Well, like, so, yeah. yeah. Well, that's any movie. So, no, but this one's specific. So, uh, like for, so yeah, I mean, I, I think it was good. I'd, I'm hoping Hereditary is kind of, this is a great, you know, little popcorn yeah. horror film that I think, you know, there are, there is places for different types of films. Yeah. And if you're going to categorize like, Hey, best monster film of the year, you know, as far as just pure monster fun and scares and being like, I don't want to call it this to diminish it, but like a B movie monster, or a, a, a B monster movie. Like yeah. this is the perfect I mean, I th- modern B monster. I movie. think it falls in Cause at one point there was discussion at Paramount, I think of turning it into a Cloverfield universe film Which I'm glad and they, they decided not to go with that and just let it be its own standalone. But, I, I, yeah. but to me, I think this is comparable to like 10 Cloverfield lane and yeah. that it feels like an episode of twilight zone or something. Um, so for me, I've kind of fall more somewhere to Sean, like I think seven and a half to eight, like mm-hmm. it's a good movie that I recommend checking out in theaters. It's got a brisk run time. It doesn't overstay its welcome. It does have some visceral thrills and it is like a movie I think that benefits from seeing it on the big screen. Um, it's not super deep and it's not going to leave you. I mean, for some people it may be because people find meaning in everything, mm-hmm. but to me, like I came away from it having enjoyed it, but not you know, just thinking about it constantly yeah. after seeing it. And it's it. mostly an audience pleaser, you know, when you're yeah. sitting in the seat, it's like, yeah, not to say like, not to say, Oh, you get everything you want and mm. all these characters triumph. It just, it gives you what you want out of a movie for the most part. It doesn't pull an obscure ending where you have to interpret the meaning of it. It is a more straightforward film. And two, there are 
good action beats and tense scenes throughout. You know what yeah. I mean? And and it doesn't hide the monster from you to because some people don't want the monster to be hidden for tension to be built. You know? Yeah. And it's almost like people really take that to heart and they do make movies like It Comes at Night, which I liked, and think, hey, we don't need to show the monster. We don't need to show the monster. And that's almost like a big thing where it's like, oh no, just don't show it the monster. It's better that way. It doesn't do the prestige horror thing that leaves a movie to high critical scores and like a D minus yeah, uh, audience and, score. And that's totally fine, but it's almost like, yeah, let's change the tides a little bit. We've seen so many films that like do the slow burn yeah. and don't really show and kind of hint at it. Like, let's get some more monster action out there. And that's what I like about this yeah, film, I mean, even though it's not a complete, you know. Most of this movie, the characters are in distress. Yeah. There, yeah. There's, there's like a large portion where you're like, you keep waiting for it to be like, okay, now everything's going to smooth back over and we're going to jump a couple more days. Yeah. And it, it didn't do that. Yeah. Wait, yeah. This is a way better version of Don't Breathe, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> so uh, if you're listening via iTunes, do us a huge favor. Leave a review there. That helps other people find the podcast. Leave us a comment on YouTube if you're listening there because we always enjoy seeing that feedback. Or you can send us an email at podcast at housebyvastore.com. Find all the stuff we're doing at the website, housebyvastore.com. Find links here to our social media accounts, so make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and all those places, because we'll have um, some short stuff in the works, and all the stuff we've done already, you can see. And if you want to follow us specifically on the internet, you can find me on Twitter, at William Caps. Uh, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter, at Meadow World Derek. I'm at Blevin Sean on Twitter. And now we'll discuss spoilers for A Quiet Place. If you haven't seen the movie, we're going to go fully through what happens in the movie and the ending. So the the movie, so the just the chronologically, so the beginning of the movie, you get a glimpse of the creature as it takes their toddler, and which is the fault of the daughter. And you would think that for the most part, that's about the only way things would eventually go, because no matter how much you try to discipline a small child, mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to make them be completely quiet, um, unless you literally go and perform surgery to remove their vocal cords. And but see, then, that's what you could do with a sequel. Have like a whole community that's like they would start operating on people yeah. and forcing then, them to remove their cords. Like you could yeah. do some crazy stuff with but it. But then like the other thing is just like a small child knocks things over. They make noise. Yeah. And so the you beginning, cut off a hand each time they do so it. So what, what you referenced, Derek, was the beginning of the movie. The little kid wants the um, shuttle, the rocket or the space shuttle toy that's in the little um, drugstore they go to. And the dad tells him no because it's, you know, too noisy and he can't have it. So then the daughter takes the batteries out of it and gives it to him anyway. But then turns and around. Then, the dad but then, takes the batteries out. Yeah, dad, first, yeah dad yeah. takes the batteries out. But the little kid takes that. Or she gives it She gives it to the kid and then the little kid picks up the batteries. So then yeah. when they're walking back to their home, the little kid is playing with it. And then he hits the button that turns the noises on. And before the dad can get back to him, one of the creatures takes him and yeah. kills or eats him. So then from that point forward, the relationship between the daughter and dad is strained because she blames herself and thinks that he blames her. Because she and, did do it. But, I mean, they're also kids, so but she was young. It's one of those things where it's like, you know, it's different if you like you break something in the house. But when you directly are responsible for the death of a human or an animal, I feel like that's so, on a different yeah, level. Yeah, you know, thinking about that, I broke one of my grandma's figurines when I was like six and like cried about it because i felt yeah. so guilty so i imagine the weight of that yeah. on, well, a, too, on a child like, but then it's like knowing like trying to figure out what age she's supposed to be i would assume like 11 yeah 10, when you're 12. The, it's like one of those things where it's like in the movie i felt like the the parents never explicitly say like you will die like that, that's something that you would have to like because to say that kids can't understand, it's like, okay, we'll go read the diary of Anne Frank and a girl that's around a similar age that has to live in a completely well, silent setting. It's like people so understand. I think, so I think the difference. So to give me that people don't understand is like, no, so that I think ain't the that first the, time in the history. The thing there comes happened. that we are all adult males that have no hearing impairment. So I think that a character that is a younger kid that has a hearing impairment feels like, uh, feels othered to begin with yeah. because of that. And then feels like they're being excluded from learning how to operate in the world they live in because of their disability and because she feels like her dad blames her for the brother's yeah. death. When reality, like I think the dad, even if, you know, even if the parents do, they probably blame themselves more than anything. And that makes him more motivated to want to get a hearing aid built for her so she can hear all the threats and she doesn't isn't isn't as writ at risk when she's out in the world by herself. Yeah. So, but she just takes that as being sidelined and not made part of it and being treated different. 
when he's probably even more, you know, the parents are probably even more motivated to not let their other children die. Yeah. So for him is trying to protect her and try to, and then there's the, the push and pull of how much do you, how much do you identify with the daughter versus the dad? Because do you think him being, you know, trying to protect her is the appropriate thing and she should just be okay with it? Or do you think that her feeling like she's being treated different, differently and not giving the chance to prove her own, like which side do you side with more? If you side more with him, then you can think the movie's incredibly frustrating and her character's annoying. If you side with her, then the movie makes more sense. And so that's where some Or of the, if you just understand the perspective of both of them you know what yeah, i mean like so you know like he doesn't where, blame her and why she would blame herself yeah. and that's why i think there's like not much struggle there you know what i mean like there's not much to think about it's both like, characters oh, I could, are reasonable yeah but. yeah like you could see like hey i get why there's and yeah. two like so the end of so the the second part of the movie where the dad so when the dad and son go off and the mom is doing laundry i guess you could theoretically say that if the daughter has stayed behind and helped the mom then the entire scenario would not have occurred that set off the events of the movie, like yeah. the the nail or the piece of mm-hmm. wood on the stairs getting pulled up that um, exposed the nail. Which doesn't make any sense how that happened. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how that happened. Because like, they had that nail perfectly exposed. It's like, okay. But like whatever it was, like the... She home alone herself. Yeah. She, so, she yeah so in Emily Blunt's character, <laughs> is taking, yeah. when she's taking the laundry upstairs and it pulls like the wood up and then it exposes the nail that she then later steps on and makes noise, that sets into to motion the entire series of events. I mean, that's a great set piece. Like, you know, like one stepping on a nail, having yeah. to be yeah. quiet about it, and then her being pregnant. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then and going into labor. Like, but it, it's, so, you know, when my wife gave birth, like, that whole experience, you know, it was probably like, I don't know, almost 20 hours. The thing I was thinking about that was one, how long it was and like, what a harrowing experience. Like, you know what I mean? You can make a whole film on that and yeah. just like, I don't know. It's, it's a cool. very, it's a very stressful Have- for them and painful and it's just but it almost seemed like it was glossed over in this film. Like, oh, it just happened. And it was yeah. like, whatever. Like, they could have mined that way more having, because yeah, oh, having she got so lucky. Yeah. Having to give birth almost completely silently or as silently as possible yeah. without medical um, professionals assisting, without painkillers, without an epidural, without all these things that people are used to having. Like, giving a natural birth essentially by yourself and having to be as quiet as possible. Like, that's tough. I almost feel like the film should have almost been more built around that. You know what I mean? Like, it should have been like, hey, this is a big threat we're waiting for. That could And then we were prepared for it. And then things went crazy and she had to do it by herself. I would be more interested to see, like, there may have been stuff on the cuttering floor that did get an R rating that had more of the birth stuff. I'm not sure how they how they rate yeah. that, but well, I guess my thing is the way I interpreted the film was like it's, it's not trying to blame everything on the, the daughter, but it is everything that happens is based around her actions at the very beginning of the film, causing the son to die, which I guess would would give the parents the need to have another child. Well, too, though, it's not established if it was an accident. I'm going to assume by the way that when she said that it was a boy and the way that he reacted to it, that was like... They were a, replacing they their were repla- child. That's what yeah. I took that as. It's like, okay, they lost a child. They're replacing him by another... Ch- not really replacing, but having another child to fill that void. So all this kind of goes back to that. And then she leaves. So all of it's like everything in the movie is kind of her fault. Like it's kind of hard to look at this and say it's not her fault but how much you blame a kid you know well like i said it's that's like, where you go to like you look at the real like you look at things and it's like you blame a kid but knowing that that world is not your normal world yeah and knowing that things aren't just but the th- way they were it you kid, need to, i think that, i think the difference are, i think a difference though is if we're closer in age to like the john krasinski and emily blunt parent characters than we are to the kid characters you then gravitate towards it's the kid's fault if you see this movie and you're 13, you're probably more siding with the kid because oh, yeah, it's closer probably. to you. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I give, I relinquish all blame on the kid. You know what I mean? Like just having nieces because around that age and stuff. Like when thinking of the dumb things I did as a kid, obviously that didn't get people killed. But like yeah. in that world, that could have. Yeah, because I mean, the stakes are so. Because like, I, like, I mean, this isn't normal teenage angst. This is like if you make any noise. Most likely you're going but to if die. You, but if you've lived in that world for over a year, does it become normalized that you don't think about the threat? Because yeah. as a kid, you don't mm-hmm. always think about the, the threat that's inherent in what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And she almost killed her other brother by being a brat on the top of the silo. So it's like, you just try to kill everybody in so your family. the movie itself, like the, the element of it, so the ending of it, 
So, you know, it was sad because you kind of got the feeling that John Krasinski, I just, I, I had the feeling he was going to die. Oh, well, I thought that either, I, honestly, and we talked about this for the podcast, I thought that the way they'd written both of those characters, him and Emily Blunt, was that neither of them were going to survive the movie. But, like, he has to sacrifice himself when the two kids are in, like, a truck that's being attacked by the creature, and then he draws the creature away, and then they're able to turn off the parking brake in the truck and roll down the driveway back to the house. They get into the house, and then a creature, you know, follows them into the house, and they find out that the combination of the frequency of the hearing aid that the girl has. Well, the one um, that uh, John, uh, that John Jim Christine, Halpert made. The, was, the frequency it was at and the sound or whatever caused interference with the creature and caused it to have, you know, trouble focusing and distress, and then taking it and putting it um, on a microphone that runs through speakers that amplifies it caused it to be incapacitated. And then able, they are then able to, once it's incapacitated, I guess like all the shielding and natural armor built in was pulled back to shoot it in the head with the shotgun and kill it, which then drew the sound of the other two creatures in the area towards the house. And then the movie ends with them kind of like with Emily Blunt and the daughter character recognizing what, how that works. And then her pumping the shotgun to, you know, unload more shots and the girl getting ready to use the speaker and stuff. So it just they know how to kill the creatures, and if they get them in the basement, they can initiate the speaker and the hearing aid and disable them enough to kill them. As long as she has another shell. Yeah. Like well, she got two in there, right? Yeah. Two in the chamber, she used one. Yeah. Well, I mean, or two other things they could yeah. do. If they, if they know there's three in the area and they get them in the basement, they're incapacitated and they don't have enough shells, they could then just all get upstairs, lock the door, and like catch it on fire or mm-hmm. something. But it lays it out where they know how to kill the creatures and they have the ability and, and you would be led to believe because, as Derek said, the, the happy ending is they kill the other two creatures and their area is clear of the monsters and they can live out the rest of their days. The unhappy ending is that it kills one or any of them mm-hmm. and and that would be like the super downer ending. But the, the tone of the movie led me to believe more it would go in the direction of them surviving. Do you think they shot a, a, a more complete ending sequence and thought, hmm, this is good. Maybe we want to do a sequel. Let's just end it here but because I, it's fine if it ends here. If you, you go, think kind of you think they did? If you go one step further and have the other creatures show up and them quickly dispatch of them using their newfound knowledge, then it goes more genre heavy and more actiony, yeah, and ends more like a Michael Bay movie than necessarily what they. I mean, even though it's I a mean, platinum, it's close it's to platinum. already, you know, being just super genre. I mean, it I is. Know. It's a monsters running around like yeah, it's, it's a genre. Anything. So would it yeah. be more? Would it be so? Ten Cloverfield Lane. That ending goes the extra step and has a character succeed yeah. and then go on. So does that make the movie? more satisfying than this one because it stops just short of showing no, I, I'm just one I'm just wondering uh, yeah, I, I, if I anything else was shot yeah. you know what I'm I mean? just That's, saying that like maybe the, like you said they did shoot it yeah. and it's just decided because that it works fine the way it is I think, yeah but. I, I kind of agree like the, at this point in the movie I don't know if it's any more or less satisfying if they killed 200 of them or yeah. if they killed the one like yeah. I, I, I think that where it ended it, it is appropriate well let's like, you on a up an upward you know emotional up and shows you like the beat of they know how to kill them if they'd only figured it out 20 minutes earlier mm-hmm. so that the dad didn't have to die well, like like i said th- I, that didn't bother me because you knew from the start of that movie that well, the way it was going there's no way that everybody's gonna survive that, no you knew that one of the family members was going you knew well, that i was the, thinking this family's too big people are gonna die yeah. because for some reason in the trailers i only thought there was one kid i don't yeah. know why well because it, it, yeah that's kind of how well, in the felt. trailer like yeah, I tried to avoid trailers for stuff, but like they only really showed the daughter and then the youngest boy. He's one of the trailers yeah. had the youngest boy playing with the thing. Yeah, that's what I remember from so the trailer. Yeah, so the movie itself, like the world they built, was like they have sand everywhere because that's quieter. Now, something when you talk about the logistics and reality of things, the grass in there around their house was too short to have not been cut, and yeah. a lawnmower would make too much noise. A push mower that simply the push blades seems like that'd be a lot of effort. Yeah. They have a scythe. So, there. so the the basic thing is, so how did they get the grass clear to not be super overgrown by their house without using modern well, tools? The biggest question is, how in the hell do they have electricity? Because there weren't there were no solar panels, and given that area they lived in, they're either using coal. Or they're using like what? There's some. There, there's there's no something they could have. There's, there's something no they could have tapped into. Like maybe the thing is like he's an energy efficiency engineer and he had built something. <laughs> no. He so didn't. here's it, the it, thing that bothered me after that, when they go back to their place and all the newspaper clippings, 
like, so then things are like, hey, the things are in New York, you know, these monsters around. Dude, like, you know how loud printing presses are? Yeah. Like, they would not have had time to print that. So stuff. basically, like, printing presses yeah. are so loud. If, like, it yeah. shakes the building. Like, they put them in the basements of buildings because of how loud so they are. So if the, if no the way they would have done that, if they were driving them around, exactly, none of it driving, makes sense. delivering yeah. newspapers, like, that if whole system movie, would have been broke down day one. If the, yeah, movie, no if the movie starts out, like, 81 days after the initial event or something... Then it seems like that's not that's you know just a couple months that's a few months um, that's like two and a half months three months whatever so if if that amount of time has passed for it to be completely post apocalyptic at that point it seems like from the moment it happened to then a lot of stuff would have broken down and people wouldn't like you said wouldn't be printing newspaper yeah. things wouldn't like, be delivering them you no, know what I mean across man. country and no. how many like, other creatures are there. There's a lot of things like that, like the world building, building things. If you think too much about yeah. the movie breaks down a little bit, well, like I, guess, I said, <laughs> they're not them not having overgrown grass everywhere. Yeah, yeah, I didn't even think about that. But that would grow up in like a couple months unless, yeah. unless it happened in the winter. Well, no, because they're like a year out, essentially. Yeah. But even then, like if you just like take a busy highway. And you just the only way drive on for two three months, you're gonna have a grass start growing up. Well, forever. I mean, but part of it is it's logistics. Nature, nature takes back everything. Fil- like just for the filmmaking, that would have been messy and taking. No, more they're time. not going to do that. And and two, like the electricity and stuff, I'm willing to overlook that no, because I'm willing. No. I'm, I'm willing to overlook it because the you can't only, overlook look, Batman look, traveling from here to there in one movie, but you can overlook that huge glaring plot hole that makes absolutely zero well, no, sense. because the batman movies have been so much about the real world and laying out logistical realistic things no i'm just this movie you, you started you off hold it so here's the thing the movie started off the bat with that being the ground rules that they had this so i wasn't gonna get too upset about yeah. how it worked until yeah. after the movie's over then you think about it because the movie didn't make it about that because they have electricity yeah. electricity itself makes noise um but then like the main thing i was thinking of well in that world what would be precious um, commodities that would be useful. And my thing was like elect, um, like gas powered, like RC cars. That'd be like fucking wor- worth a shit ton because the second something starts coming towards you, you can turn it on, just have it go in the yeah. opposite direction, like miles out. And then, or like a drone, like you couldn't really practice the drone whatsoever, but you could turn it on when they got close and have it fly away. Yeah. Before they even like lit that firework off, I thought, man, I would just have tons of fireworks and just throw them out, you know, out of the, yeah. like just or throw them off what the I would do stuff. is if you could, if you had the materials to like, if you had the materials in some of those little like Raspberry Pi, like, um, controller boards and batteries and stuff. So like the little like Android boards that have like, um, operating systems that you could pre-program to do stuff. I would set up. Like those like on like time delay triggers that have like bombs Mm -hmm. and set one up a mile out, two miles out, three miles out four, and just have it go as far as you can walk in a single day and have them all timed to go off like a couple days apart to draw the creatures out miles and miles from where you're at and likely keep them there so that you have clear space. But or or build your house right around a waterfall too. you know what I mean? Go to Niagara Falls. (laughs) Yeah, that way you'd be fine. So that's what I think. You know, it's always fun thinking about this stuff. I, I was... But then you realize if all this stuff worked, if they had yeah. all the stuff that worked properly, then there's no movie. But, but no, man, I think there, there could be a movie there. But like, I think I was reading a thing about the making of Left 4 Dead when they were designing that game and and the safe rooms and that. And they were talking about people love to prep, you know, yeah. like get their guns Dude, ready and they stuff. Prep. I think the second, like a second film could be about that. It could be about all these little things people make. But it feels that would be a fun thing to it, watch, like yeah. to watch people get ready and like these ideas to come well, back. Or just like, like the guy from Trimmers, like the obsessed gun nut. That's, in, well, that's the second movie I thought about this. I was like, this is yeah. like a new Tremors, but more serious. Something yeah. else this made me think of, though, is the first half of I Am Legend with Will Smith. I haven't seen of, it. Um, kind of the post-apocalyptic mm-hmm. New York. So that one's kind of like he has a routine that works of how he does things. So this, I mean, like, so those are kind of similar movies. Mm-hmm. Now, the second half of I Am Legend goes in a big budget blockbuster action territory. Yeah, just falls As apart. opposed to, like, so the first half of that movie feels similar to this movie. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that fall apart upon further consideration. But in the visceral moments of the movie, you're not thinking about and i think it succeeds there but if you think about it too much afterwards yeah. the thrill ride experience of it is what you're meant to take away not the world building yeah aspect. i mean i think it's a fun roller coaster i think that's what this film is it was what it's designed to be and uh i you know as a b b movie type 
experience. Like, I think it's yeah. great. But also, yeah, you can't put this up against The Exorcist or The Shining. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, not, just, it's something yeah, that falls not, apart like, easily, but that's okay for what it is. I mean, I think like 10 Cloverfield Lane, there's like a lot of movies are kind of fun B movies that have good performances and can leave you with some things to mm-hmm. think about. They're not all time classics, mm-hmm. but they're very solid. Mm-hmm. Now, put it in that category like a yeah, solid movie. That- it's not an all-time classic. And I'm glad we're getting these because it's yeah. fun to have these type of films well, mixed in see, with your Annihilation yeah. Yeah. or, you know what I mean, or It Comes at Night. Like, it's cool to have... This is actually probably going to do better than both of them. Yeah, this is yeah. cool to have these different types of experiences yeah, it's in gonna the theaters. O- it's going to make more in the opening weekend than Annihilation does yeah, worldwide. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, it's like, you know, it's not that I... I guess, too, like, from what I read, I got something a little bit different than... Because when you talk about monster movie, like... Again, to me, this movie, while there was was monsters in it, it, I didn't feel like at any point in time they were the real focus. It was the family, mm-hmm. and they were just kind of well. That's every the, movie, really. Yeah, it's, it's all allegorical, and but it's like you know, I like it if it could just maybe shift a little bit more. Like the stuff I liked was like when Emily Blunt is in the tub, mm-hmm. which is something you kind of talk, yeah. talk about when she's having a child or starting to have the childbirth. And in the movie, I can't remember now. Because I remember in the trailer seeing this, but in the movie, did you still see the thing crawling up the stairwell? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I couldn't yeah. remember that because I was like, oh, oh yeah, she's yeah. in the bathtub and you see it right behind her. And it her. almost gets to her, but then the fireworks start. Yeah. So it draws the creature away. So. And then he goes in there and she had given, she got into the showering and room. And then she has the, they have the cliche bloody hand on the yeah. door. Yeah. <laughs> like, so that was so a cliche. cliche moment, so John, John Krasinski had said that he wasn't like a huge horror fan, but it feels like he did his research and used a lot of horror tropes yeah. in this movie. Yeah. Um, which is what people want. So, I mean, yeah, and they had killed the raccoons, and it's like, don't yeah. kill raccoons, man. Well, they had, that was like the unearned jump scares. They couldn't tell if it was a creature, but it ended up just being like a pair of raccoons. Yeah, and, and that does show, one of them. that does show why there's not that much wildlife yeah. um, in that area, and why you couldn't have like a farm with animals. And why they noise. were eating fish instead but of anything else. Like, they yeah. did have a bunch of crickets making noises in the movie a lot. But like, like if there's crickets making crickets. noises, they can't, like the creatures literally can't kill every cricket, and I think no. they would just come to accept that, that would as be the funny if they were <laughs> But they don't seem that smart either. You know, they yeah. seem very... I, yeah, another thing too, it's like, okay, obviously if they're sensitive to hearing, maybe that's their weakness. You know, yeah. like you would think from the beginning, like, let's just try to like blast them with sound or do something. You know what well, I mean? Well, like, from, from my time, out there yeah. from my too. time watching just like Spider-Man cartoons, the way you fought Venom because the symbiotes were like susceptible to like sonic mm-hmm. and noise disturbances was to use like noise weapons. Yeah. So if there's creatures that can hear, they use hearing. Like, just look at bats, like, that use, like, echolocation or dolphins or creatures that use that. How would you kill them easily? And then just uh, crank that up Mm -hmm. and try every frequency possible. That's that's where this is kind of like signs because of the water. But the thing is, yeah, so it's kind of like something you think somebody would have figured out. But at the same time, if the invasion happened immediately and it was so overwhelming that people didn't have time to react. Yeah. But then again, like you said, there's the, the newspaper clippings yeah. that indicate that it took a little while. So there's things that fall apart on further thought, but in the moment and in the movie, it doesn't really hurt it. So I think we're just nitpicking it. Yeah. And but that, the, the experience is just to watch it and, the, and feel this family's, you know, traversing this this incident from yeah. just their perspective. Again, like I, this is, I think, a perfect film to be on TV, flip it on, and like you can watch one scene and get some enjoyment out of it. Yeah. yeah. And you don't have to watch <laughs> the whole thing or you can watch the whole thing and enjoy it too because yeah. it's so short. So yeah, I'm, just I, I'm glad this film exists. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Yeah. Um, I I'm hoping, it, I'm hoping, I'm hoping, you know, end up being, you know, not even in my top five best horror films of the year. It could be top five, but I'm hoping the other ones are so good. Well, it's going to deliver something completely different than what the yeah. Halloween is going to do and, and other things. So. Yeah. So I guess that can uh, wrap up our discussion on A Quiet Place. The next episode, we'll be discussing The Sentinel, the movie from 1977 that has a lot of familiar faces in it. Maybe not familiar voices, but we'll discuss yeah. when we get to that. But uh, that'll bring this episode of the House of Sword podcast to a close. Thanks for listening.